Light was in my heart, light was in my thoughts, light was in my words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. I've been doing this show for a long time, and essentially we deal with anything pertaining to life or spirituality, trying to uh, get beneath the surface and really wrestle with what does it mean and how do we make use of it. And one of the questions that came up the other day was the, the challenge of distinguishing blame from responsibility. And in what sense do we use blame? There, I mean, to a certain extent, blame is, a, is synonymous with cause. But there's another relational psychological dynamic of blame where it's about not taking responsibility for something that happened and blaming it on someone else as if blaming it on them means that you're released from the responsibility to do what you can. And to me that's kind of erroneous thinking. Just because someone has suffered a loss or even has a disability or uh, has limited resources and there may be reasons for that, causes of that, that is legitimate blame rather than false blame. But even that doesn't release the person affected from their responsibility to respond in whatever constructive way they're able. So that, for example, if a person is going blind, I would say, well, in order to avoid being further victimized by this condition, it is now your responsibility to at least try to learn Braille and to try to learn to walk with a white cane and to, you know, at the same time as you may be looking for miracle cures with your eye doctor and so forth, to try to learn uh, so that if you don't succeed in preventing the blindness from progressing, that you will not be uh, someone who sits at home waiting to be taken care of like a pet uh, like a pet in a cage or something, but that you will be an independent person able to do whatever it is that you can still do. There, uh, I had a friend at one point in the past who uh, went through a horrible accident and became paraplegic, but his one love in life was ranching. And so uh, at that point, everyone thought it was over. He was victimized. It was a loss from which there was no recovery, and he said, you know, forget that. And he figured out how to do his ranching from a wheelchair. In, in wrestling with our topic of blame and responsibility, he could blame the fact that he was paraplegic on the accident. He had a responsibility to himself to do whatever he could so that his life would not become less than it would otherwise be. And it, I guess it's it's kind of also back to the serenity prayer uh, to some extent, but I'm not entirely fond of the serenity prayer because I think there are other conditions that need to be uh, considered. The serenity prayer is used by lots of 12-step groups and basically says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, 
the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, more recently, I saw someone paraphrase that into uh, finding the courage to change the things I cannot accept. Uh, and it, it becomes kind of a, a, a judgment call as to when you say the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Well, that I cannot change now or that I cannot change ever or that I cannot change with this particular method, but if I switch to that method, I may be able to change it. It's not as black and white and as simple as uh, the way it's initially presented. The, the whole thinking of there are things in this life that you cannot change uh, essentially encourages a sort of learned helplessness that people are taught that you can't change this and you can't change that and you can't change that. Well, if people believe that they can't change enough different things, it leaves them vulnerable to tyrants and dictators and manipulators of every sort. And just because someone hasn't used a gun and hasn't drawn blood doesn't mean that they are not a dictator and a tyrant in various ways. There are ways of attacking people emotionally and psychologically to where you reduce their ability to respond to where you eradicate their ability for them to even believe in themselves. And that becomes uh, what's known as learned helplessness. That from that point on, whenever they face a particular sort of challenge, they will interpret and assume that they cannot resolve that and so that they have to take whatever the dictator says is the only answer. That, uh, well, it, it reminds me of an, an excerpt from a wonderful book called Everything I Need to Know About Life I Learned in Kindergarten. And it's the author is reflecting on his experiences with working with kids in, in pseudo-educational settings. And there is one event he goes to where uh, he wants them to engage their imaginations and their creativity and to physicalize it and act it out. And so he comes in and says, we're going to play uh, this uh, medieval sort of game and you are giants, trolls, and elves. Decide who you are now and get in your groups and prepare to uh, parade across uh, the room in the fashion of whatever you are. And at that point, uh, he feels this tug on his sleeve and he looks down and there's this little, gr little girl standing next to him saying, where do the mermaids stand? And he says, there are no mermaids. And she says, yes, there are. I'm a mermaid. I'm not a giant. I'm not a troll. I'm, I'm not an elf. I'm a mermaid. And so thinking quickly and not wanting to be discouraging, which I guess shows him to be a good teacher, he says, you stand right here next to the king of the sea. And to himself, he's thinking the king of all fools, you know. And, and the rest of that excerpt, he's reflecting on how there are people who don't fit any of the prescribed categories. And instead of telling them, you don't exist, we have to give them a place to stand. It's the ways that defining what is normal without and, and projecting it onto reality instead of having reality define what is normal to us. The reason we say a day is this much amount of time is because the sun shines that amount of time and we experience daylight for that amount of time and it changes seasonally and so we establish a norm for whichever season but we understand that it's also affected by cloud cover and so forth. That even on days when it's supposed to be absolute daylight, there can be storms that come through with such thick clouds that it's almost as dark as night in the middle of the day. There's also this wonderful phenomenon called an eclipse that changes the norm of a day and we have to account for it. Science, uh, scientific measurement and documentation has made some of this predictable to a degree. There are still more things that, soci that science has not finished defining than that it has defined because the universe is a very, very big place. 
But, and of course, one of the big things in our own time that really threw a wrench into it is the whole idea of uh, quantum physics, by which the physics that we thought were the norms have suddenly been pushed uh, to the side and new norms are being written. And that's where, it, it coming back to Einstein as the one who said, I attempted to live a normal life but found it was quite impossible for me. I wonder if in some ways that doesn't specifically apply to his discovery of relativity and the ways that he opened the door for the discovery of quantum physics and such, that what he perceived as normal was not applicable to his life because within his life he was becoming aware of things that could only be explained by quantum physics, not by the, the physics that had been normal up to that point. In my own life, um, as Sister Who, wanting to step outside the norm, not so much because I wanted to step outside the norm, but because I looked inside and I saw truth and it was compelling and inspiring and, and it wasn't normal and it wasn't normative for anyone but myself. And the fact that no one else was doing it didn't make it any less real for me. And like the mermaid standing next to the teacher uh, who dubbed himself the king of the sea and so that the mermaid and the king of the sea could watch this grand parade of giants, trolls and elves uh, going by in wild disarray and, and acting out their imaginations, that he had the humility, even he had the narcissism to dub himself king of the sea instead of the, the court page or something like that. But he had the humility to say that it is not true. There are no such thing as mermaids because I have held her hand. And to validate this young girl's imagination and say that if you find yourself to be a mermaid, then who am I to say that you're not? And I guess bridging from that to people with disabilities, I would say when a, a blind person or a deaf person or a paraplegic person or a, an autistic person or any disability you want to name, when they say that they think of things in this way, when they have a sensitivity to light or sound or vibration or smell, who are we to say that they don't? How can we, where do we have the divine ability to perceive what we don't perceive? And how can we say that that which we do not perceive does not exist? At one time, we were not able to perceive radiation. Now we have Geiger counters. Radiation was equally real before the invention of the Geiger counter. How many more things are equally real before we have a way to measure them or even detect that they're there? So when someone gives a report of such and such to instead of saying that couldn't possibly be, to instead help them to deconstruct it and to, to help them think about it, that well, if that were true, then this would also be true. And if, if it wasn't, then that tells us that it's a different shape than we thought. If there is an invisible something between me and uh, a light source, there will be a shadow. Even if it's invisible, uh, it is an object that is there. It's an object I can't see, but it's an object that is there. If it's invisible to me, that means I cannot perceive it. It would have to also be invisible to the light in order for the light to pass through it and not cast a shadow. If it's still there, but it's invisible, I shouldn't be able to walk through it. If it is not only invisible, but it's also intangible, then that means I can't touch it. I could walk through it, but then we have to come up with some way of defining how it is there. And if it is, if it is there in a way that we do not have the ability to measure, you know, radiation is not something you can touch, not something you can smell, not something you can feel but it is something that will make you sick. We needed a Geiger counter to tell us it was there so that we would stop getting sick. But before the Geiger counter, there was no way to know one way or the other. 
but we could for, but we could not for that reason say that there was nothing there because there was still an effect that could not be explained in the 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 part that I might be overlooking, though, to step onto a different track about uh, Einstein's quote, um, I attempted to live a normal life, but found that it was quite impossible for me. It starts in a very active stance. Einstein says that he attempted to live a normal life. He wasn't waiting for it to happen. He wasn't expecting it to be given to him. He attempted to go out and live it. He attempted to do it. He strove to find the answers because it, in a sense you could say that he could not tolerate the questions. He couldn't just be there and not respond to the question. It, it inspired him, it drove him, it gave him energy to search it out. And so he attempted to live, he attempted to live basically is the first part of it. And in attempting to live, it took him beyond anything normal was able to uh, embrace. In granting each of ourselves as, uh, as an individual, as exceptional in some way, which I'm, I've met so many people who insist they are not exceptional, there's nothing special about me, I'm totally ordinary, I have no story, I have never found it to be true because every single person I've talked with has some sort of experience that no one else has, some sort of conclusion or perception that no one else has. And to the extent that I can understand what is unique to them, I am more able to see the unique things about myself and about other people I meet. In a sense, other people's reports become my Geiger counter to alert me to the presence of an energy that I can neither see nor touch, but is real. and by bringing all these energies together, there's a, a far greater chance that things turn out right because there is more resources with which to address every challenge. In thinking of this teacher who um, he and, the, and his little mermaid watching this parade of giants, trolls, uh, and elves, and it's all imaginary, it's all invisible, and yet it's all beyond normal and it's all empowering because it gave them an energy and a dimension of themselves that they didn't have before. I, I read a lot of different books, but all of that echoes and, and resonates with another quote from one of my favorite authors, Barbara Sher, that when she commented that maybe we all think we're special and maybe we all are, uh, but like the people who lived before the invention of the Geiger counter, we don't realize the, the radiation that is there. We don't realize the energy that is there. And we don't realize to what good use it can be put. That it is not only bad, it, is simply, it simply is in and of itself. And once we discover it and know where it is and know that we have to have a certain safe distance, and that it is contained by certain things but applicable to other things, we begin to form a symbiotic, mutually empowering relationship. That in a sense, radiation is looking for someone to give it boundaries so that it is not spreading everywhere and making people sick, but it is contained in an appropriate way and in an effective way so that it can be put to good use instead of being left to its own devices and stumbling into bad uses. I was talking with someone the other day about um, teenagers and um, and dogs, especially pit bull dogs, that, uh, but not, well, I guess not really especially pit bull, pit bull dogs, any dogs. In both cases, they need good parenting in order to bring out the best in themselves, that there's a sense in which my pit bull service dog is wanting me to give directions. And when I fail to give directions, he has to find other ways of, of resolving his emotional dilemmas and his need to be his need to be needed basically, his need to be with me. And by giving him direction, providing parameters and boundaries and purpose and uh, a service to do 
something to contribute, that it allows his life to be more full and more beautiful and more wonderful and more admired and applauded than it otherwise would be. If I had not made that contribution, he couldn't do that. If I had not taught him about riding on a motorcycle and made it possible for him to ride on my motorcycle with me, uh, he couldn't do that. He wouldn't be getting photographed. He wouldn't get compliments. He wouldn't be admired and uh, appreciated by people wherever we go. His life would be less. The, the point of life, I guess, to me, when it comes right down to it, is to be more because at the fundamental the fundamental building blocks of life is this mitosis of cells dividing in order to multiply and one cell becoming two and two cells becoming four and so on until all these cells form a body and the cells differentiate into the different organs that the body needs in the same way the global family of humanity being this sort of huge energetic, spiritual, relational body that goes way beyond the physical dimensions of any one person. And by, become, by developing symbiotic complementary relationships, making humanity capable of uh, possibilities and realities even that previous generations have only dreamed of. That's all the wonderful stuff that can happen between us between where we are now and that, however, are all the problems of the current generations that have focused on being small, that have focused on mere profits and existences and pleasurable experiences, and none of which are bad in and of themselves, but when that becomes the whole of your world, the, the only thing upon which you do focus, there's all the rest of you left behind and left in a box. It's, it's kind of like getting, when I was in college, I would occasionally receive care packages, uh, a box full of all sorts of thoughtful things that somebody would send. And they were just simply called care packages, and they were usually surprises and uh, surprise deliveries, unexpected, you didn't know they were coming, and you get this box. And this is a metaphor I'm fond of using because it is so applicable to so many of the challenges of life. And in a sense, each of us is a care package from God. And we open the box and we spend our whole lives taking out the contents, figuring out what's in there. And if there's something in there that is absolutely not normal, um, or if there is something in there that needs to be dealt with because it has a shelf life, a food item that needs to be eaten within a certain amount of time. And if it is more than I could eat in one in that period of time, I, it would give me an opportunity to share that with somebody and make new friends. There was the one time uh, when I still had my house in northwest Denver that I, I built this big structure in the backyard that I called my cathedral. And the idea was that it would ultimately be completely covered with grapevines. Well, I planted grapes at the base of each pole and they began to grow. And unfortunately, the, the sad part is that I... Uh, when they withdrew support for my doctoral program, I was not able to maintain the mortgage payment and I lost the house because I couldn't come up with a way quickly enough to keep it. But it was just prior to that that the grapevines were actually getting to the point where they had almost covered the entire structure. And there was one year when they uh, produced grapes in abundance and it was amazing. I had never grown grapes before and they were seedless red grapes but they tasted very different than anything I ever bought in a grocery store. It was kind of a, a, a sweet sort of taste, almost like wine, but not alcoholic, uh, but with the flavoring of, that I can only associate with the few times when I've had a sip of wine, and absolutely delicious. But there were so many of them. I, I mean... Uh, gallons and gallons of these grapes and the problem with any food item is it has a certain shelf life and if you don't eat it within that time it begins to spoil and so I had to share them with others and and say you know I just picked these they need to be eaten within the next week um, you know here enjoy tell me what you think of them and so forth uh, the ones that I did eat though were absolutely delicious in 
and I have never ever since had grapes that were as delicious. But it was that, it was the things that come into my life that I didn't plan on, that I simply respond to with love and gratitude. And, and then it was so wonderful, I find myself looking up to heaven going, and why did you give it to me and then take it all away? And I'm, I'm forced to come back to the, to the, you know, ultimately all I can say is thank you for the memories. And I'm reminded of John Denver's song uh, in which there's a particular phrase where he says, uh, just a gathering of memories and then we are gone. And he's celebrating life at the same time as he's recognizing its finiteness, but also recognizing how special it is. And in one sense, it, it's one of the hardest lessons of life, I guess, to come to terms with the way we are creatures of time and we run out of time. And it is about making memories while we can, because as fast as we make them, they become memories. You, I, I could never stay within that current experience. And, you know, times without number, I have advocated against stagnating in any particularly memory or moment of life. As wonderful as living in that house was and eating grapes from the grapevine on the cathedral in my backyard, what I called my cathedral, and walking the meditation labyrinth that I built in the floor of the cathedral, uh, as wonderful as all that was, I would be the first one to concede that as much as I would love to be able to visit it anytime I want, I can't stay here. In the same way that Thoreau ultimately said, I left the pond for the same reason I went there, that there were more experiences and more life to be lived. And that's where I guess I, in conclusion, I would just say, if you cannot be normal, if you have to be who you are, that too can be the most wonderful blessing humanity could ever request. Thank you for watching and I hope that what I have shared in the last half hour is empowering to you as you go on being the unique and special individual that you are.